Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Effective Strategies for Preparing for Post-Secondary Programs, presented by Dr. Manuel Rosa. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today um, talking about a topic that is extremely relevant now that we are in, some of you are in your last uh, days, hours, week of school. Um, and that is uh, preparing our students for a transition and for, and for what, what their options are and what the possibilities are for the future. Um, but as you will see throughout this presentation, this is something that, that should be in our infrastructure, that should be in our curriculum right from the very beginning when the student uh, transitions to middle school or even trans and, and transitions from middle school to high school. Um, so we will talk about that as the time uh, as we go through our program. So our outcomes, um, we're going to identify student goals for life after high school and explore options for post-secondary um, education. So we're going to go back and forth between the different options that uh, students with disabilities have uh, after they complete high school and, and, and what those looks like. Uh, this workshop, um, if you've been watching our series, uh, our library, you'll notice I've done several workshops, and this one is very timely because it's it is uh, the the culmination of all of our um, webinars that 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 we that I have been doing. So I'm it's I'm extremely uh, proud and honored to, to be doing this uh, for you and and to reinforce the importance of encouraging and preparing our students. Uh, for life after high school. So in a, in the very beginning, we talked about a creative and inclusive classroom. That was one of our webinars. We talked about the Dis Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. I'm sure you are familiar with that, uh, but just in case, and I also like to uh, prepare these PowerPoints so that you can also be the trainer and 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 take these PowerPoints and deliver them to your stakeholders, whether that be your students, uh, your teachers, your, your parents, community partners, uh, your districts. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, this act was enacted in 1975, um, and it mandates the provision of a free and appropriate public school education for eligible students ages three to 21. Uh, eligible students are those identified by a team of professionals as having a disability that adversely affects academic performance and as being in need of special education and related services. And just very interesting to know, both the number and percentage of students served under IDEA declined from 2004 through 2011. Between 2011 and 2017, the number of students served increased from 6.4 to 7 million. And the percentage served increased from 13% of total public enrollment to 14% of total public school enrollment. So this just reinforces what important role you play in helping students with disabilities uh, navigate through the academic pipeline and look at their options and, and graduate with their diplomas and be prepared for whatever life uh, has for them with the goal of getting a, a college degree when possible. Here's a little bit more uh, of a video that shows just some statistics. Uh, I'm a big fan of statistics. Uh, so this just shows some information about why it is important that this population is prepared uh, for the workforce and for education, educational attainment. recent analysis in the Condition of Education report from NCES explores how the employment status of persons with disabilities varies by their educational attainment level. In this analysis, persons were classified as having one or more disabilities if they reported difficulty with any of the following tasks. For example, difficulty seeing even when wearing glasses. Overall, 14.4 million or 9% of the 25 to 64 year old population reported at least one of these disabilities in 2015. The disability rate was higher for older adults than for younger adults. Within each age group, the disability rates for those who had completed college were lower than for those who had not completed high school. 
For example, the disability rate for older adults with a master's degree was not measurably different from the rates for young adults who had not completed high school. The analysis also explored how employment outcomes vary by disability status and education level. Persons were classified as employed, unemployed, a category that includes individuals without jobs who are actively looking for work, or not in the labor force, a category that includes individuals without jobs who are not actively looking for work. Within each age group, the percentage of persons who were employed was higher for persons without disabilities than for those with disabilities. Lower levels of educational attainment were associated with lower employment percentages, both for persons with and without disabilities. The gap in employment percentages between those with and without disabilities was smaller for those with a bachelor's or higher degree than for those with an associate's degree those with a high school credential and those who had not completed high school. Although there were large gaps in the employment and not in labor force percentages between adults with and without disabilities, there was no measurable difference in the unemployment percentage between these two groups. While higher percentages of persons with disabilities were not participating in the labor force for all educational attainment levels, the largest differences were among those with lower levels of educational attainment. Among those who had not completed high school, the percentage of persons with disabilities who were not in the labor force was 51 percentage points higher than the percentage for those without disabilities. Visit nces.ed.gov to view the full report and learn more about the relationship between disability statuses, educational attainment, and labor force outcomes. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. And once again, it highlights um, the need for, um, for us to, when we can, to encourage and prepare students with disabilities for life after high school trying our best to motivate them to uh, go attain college and a college degree so they can be successful, uh, but also preparing, setting realistic expectations as well. And we're gonna go over some more of those specifics, uh, but if you are uh, delivering this workshop, I encourage you to, 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 to show this video. And if you're interested to download the, the full report. So just some more statistics. Uh, to further elaborate on the issue, uh, student ages 6 to 21 served under IDEA. About 95% of students ages 6 to 21 in fall were enrolled in regular schools. Some 3% of students served under IDEA were enrolled in separate schools, public or private, for students with disabilities. 1% were placed by their parents in regular private schools, and less than 1% each were homebound or in hospitals. So as you can see, many of our many of students with disabilities are enrolled in the school system. And it's our job, as you already know, by attending this webinar, uh, to help uh, facilitate that process and help this population of students and all population of students uh, succeed. And then, and finally, uh, about 16% of 25 to 60 year olds who are not completed high school had one or more disabilities. Uh, and this was highlighted by the video, uh, all these different percentages. Uh, clearly showing that the, the, the more, the higher degree one can earn, uh, the more chances of success. And that's true students with disabilities or students without disabilities. Uh, so trying to encourage uh, students uh, to obtain a, a college degree. So um, most of this will talk will be included in your transition planning um, strategies that you have for your schools, in your schools or, or agencies. Um, and a truly successful transition process is a result of comprehensive team planning that is driven by the dreams, desires, and abilities of youth. A transition plan provides the basic structure for preparing an individual to live, work, and play in the community as fully and independently as possible. So regardless of your transition program, this should definitely be uh, included in your mission uh, to make sure that all, these, all the students, uh, it's a student-centered approach, and we're going to talk more specifically about student-centered approach uh, later on in our uh, discussion. So transition services, 
um, what are transition services? If you, if you are starting from scratch or you're trying to evaluate your own transition services, uh, then here are some things, here are some strategies that are gonna be helpful for uh, making sure we, we support our students with learning disabilities. So uh, it should be, if you're creating from scratch, should be designed to be within a results-oriented process that is focused on improving the academic and functional achievement of the child with a disability to facilitate the child's movement from school to post-school activities, including post-secondary education, vocational education, integrated education, continuing adult education, adult services, independent living, or community participation. So having a curriculum, an intentional curriculum uh, that is infused throughout the student's experience uh, with these components is going to help students uh, with their transition. Uh, it should be based on the individual child's needs, taking into account the strengths, preferences, and interests. And that is very important. We're gonna talk about this later. Uh, even having the child be the one to lead these discussions and no matter how uncomfortable it is, and, and, and talk about what they see their future is and what see they see their strengths are. We, we mentioned this in our goal setting workshop, uh, so make sure you catch that uh, on our on-demand uh, library. Um, uh, it should have instruction. Any other related services that will help to support the student. Uh, community experiences, getting involved, uh, just uh, we talked about service learning in a, in a previous webinar, so getting those students out there and active and, and tying in that service component. Um, we should be developing employment and other post-school adult living objectives. And then finally, uh, being intentional with ac the acquisition of daily living skills and provisions of a functional uh, vocational evaluation. So we prepare students for their success. So when they're out there in the world and they're being evaluated, uh, they're going to be successful. So while the, the kids, these students are in your classrooms, or in your schools, uh, these are things they can be uh, learning that's gonna help them apply to the workforce and college as well. So some of this is very obvious, but I think it's important we, we go over it, uh, especially in those days when you may feel like uh, frustrated because maybe a student is not progressing as, as, as you would like. Uh, but going back to, you know, it can, are there other areas you can focus on uh, to get that student ready if they're not being successful on the task that you already have planned for them right at that moment. So reading and writing, uh, vocabulary, spelling, handwriting, typing, uh, those are things that you do on a daily basis. Uh, math, if you're not specifically teaching math, uh, there could be ways you can incorporate math, you know, basic computation, money, uh, measurement, uh, even uh, just telling time on a clock uh, is something that you, you could be helping. Uh, problem solving, and role modeling problem solving, whether you are having a challenge and you talk about it out loud um, and, and work through the problem so the students can see that how that planning process goes, or if there's a problem in the classroom and, and having the students uh, you know, talk about it and, and, and process it out loud. A listening comprehension, something all of us can benefit from, um, and, and having students intentionally listen and repeat back or, uh, whether verbally or through pictures or in writing what was said. Uh, speaking, even for our shy students or students who are with limited uh, verbal abilities, just having them as much as possible be able to express themselves either verbally or non-verbally. Uh, computer skills, um, students, most students love to be on the computer and, and, and play with different apps. So maybe that is their niche and their forte. So incorporating that into, into the curriculum that could be applied to the workforce. Uh, art or music for those students that want to be creative um, or that's that's how best they learn through expressing themselves or listening to that and then always a, a foreign language uh, the, especially here in Florida you're going to probably encounter someone who who speaks a different language uh, and that's always good uh, a good skill to possess so focusing on these uh, items um, will help students uh, be competitive in the workforce so specifically, if you want to teach about communication, because whether students are going to college or to the workforce, uh, students are going to have to communicate um, things you can practice and, and implement your 
classroom are following and giving directions accurately. So if you notice there's a student who, no matter what you say, is just doesn't seem to understand or comprehend, then that could be a time to work with that student and, and make sure that, uh, find out what the underlying issue is, uh, because this is an important aspect of, of adulthood and, and, be, and uh, career. Uh, communicating information, if, if you're having uh, problems with a student and a student not expressing himself uh, correctly, then that's something that you can assist with. Um, understanding and processing information, if even after providing directions, uh, you notice know students maybe not be um, being able to pay attention or, or just not understanding. So having those conversations and, and practicing, practicing that. And then requesting or offering assistance. Uh, many of our students are prideful or and may not, or it's in their culture not to ask for help. Uh, but when students get to college, they may not, in order for them to qualify for services or to seek services, uh, they're gonna have to, during the admissions process, uh, ask for accommodations if, if they need those. So it's important that we train, so, and if students are going to the workforce, uh, and they need help or, or want to be able to offer or, or, or pro provide more capacity uh, than, than, than having those conversations specifically uh, will help students. Social and interpersonal skills in your classrooms, in addition to the vocational skills that could be applied, uh, social and interpersonal skills is also something you could be uh, helping with as, as through your activities, through your lesson plans, or through conversations. Um, answering the phone and taking a message, that's a great way to do role playing, because uh, that's something that people would, uh, a, a possible job skill that can be done on in the workforce. Um, making necessary phone calls and to employers and other professionals as part of a job requirement. Um, displaying appropriate workplace behavior and etiquette. So practicing, uh, if you have, I know we don't have physical phones anymore, but even if you, if you use your cell phone or, or, or just get one of those uh, fake traditional phones, uh, but practicing the, the, the dialing, the greeting, um, and displaying appropriate workplace behavior and etiquette may be hard for students that uh, don't have to practice their self-control. So definitely paying attention and, and working on that or providing a, a suitable uh, referral uh, or job that 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 would that the student could function in uh, knowing appropriate the topics for discussion in the workplace. S students just may not be aware of of may of what's appropriate or what should be uh, straight away from whether it be religion or polit or politics or um, their personal life or hygiene or talking about others. So you know sometimes we think you know oh well the parents may have taught this or or the student or the student would find out, uh, but we need to be intentional about this. Knowing when and when not to socialize on the job, this is an important conversation to have with, with students. Uh, and you can tell those students who are uh, in your classrooms who may be socializing a little bit too much and, and not focused. And just because they're in the workplace doesn't mean that's gonna, they're gonna naturally put two and two together and think, well, that's how they should be behaving in the, in the workplace as well. So uh, being intentional with that, uh, learning how to protect themselves from victimization uh, if, they, if, if they feel like they're being bullied or um, being uh, having negative uh, connotations or behavior against them, then giving them the tools and the strategies to speak up and, um, and, and, and protect themselves and to be positive. And then learning social problem solving skills, and that is um, through your activities and as I stated previously, uh, giving intentional uh, obstacles so that students can, can attempt to overcome them uh, through intentional problem solving. Things they will also have to learn that you can infuse into your curriculum, incorporate into your curriculum when preparing students for the workforce, um, using a time card or a punch clock, um, whether it be biometrics or some uh, employees uh, you have to punch in online and reinforcing the importance of you know punching in in order to get paid and, and punching out uh, punching in and out during uh, for uh, lunchtime and then being productive and making sure that when you are on the job that you're you're focusing on uh, 
the job at hand. Uh, arriving to work on time, if a student's not arriving to your class on time, chances are uh, they may not be arriving to work on time either. So having that conversation when a student arrives late or doesn't come back from break or is not ready during transition time, uh, to have that, to compare that to the workforce. Uh, calling when sick, some students may not realize that they don't have to do that in school for the most part. So intentionally telling students, you know, if, if you're not feeling well, then you have to call your supervisor and, um, and explain to them that, that you're not feeling well. Uh, requesting vacation time, they can't just, as obviously they just can't uh, disappear, uh, even though we, we would all like to have that. Um, and go away and, and just come back whenever, but uh, we, you know, we need to ex explain this to our students. Uh, using the appropriate voice, tone, and volume, uh, that's something when we see students are agitated or, or, or speaking up, that's something we can be reminding students of. Accepting instructions and corrections, uh, feedback is important and it, it is a, a, um, uh, the reality of everyday life, um, accepting instructions and, and, and corrections and sometimes those corrections can get um, out of hand, uh, especially when you think about social media or feedback. Uh, but so, so preparing our students for that. And then um, knowing appropriate interaction with coworkers. Again, if they're displaying this type of behavior in your classroom, the likelihood of it manifesting itself in the workplace is, is, is great. So teaching them about getting along, about social problem solving, making friends, uh, recognizing boundaries, um, and tying that into culture as well um, is, is important. So you should be engaging in an informative, uh, informal and formal assessments of students as individuals. So that way they are prepared when they leave your schools especially when they when they graduate from high school, that they know where their strengths are and where their areas of opportunity are. Um, for those students, and most of them are on IEPs, uh, this will definitely be a formal section that talks about transition uh, when the student becomes age 16 or um, if they feel like it's necessary earlier. So having this all figured out and prepared will help your um, IEP process, but would also help the student and, you know, getting everyone involved in that. So having an assessment that assesses the academic skills, and that is their capabilities, both their strengths and their areas opportunities, uh, daily living skills, and consulting a parent with, with all this, and the student, of course, would be ideal. Uh, any personal and social skills that you observe that are their strengths and areas opportunity, um, occupation and, and vocational skills. If, if, if you see them uh, b being good communicators or knowing how to type or knowing how to use the computer, uh, anything that can, that can uh, translate into the workforce. Uh, career maturity, you know, emotional intelligence, how, how will they be able to handle a career and, and which career would, would their personality uh, fit? Uh, and, and, and their vocational interests and aptitude and, and aligning interest and aptitude because you can be interested in something uh, but perhaps not be the have the aptitude for it. Uh, you may want to be a doctor but uh, there may be challenges if you're not good in science. Um, so maybe doing a medical assistant or uh, but you know being realistic about the students intentions but not uh, you know shattering their their dreams. So it's, it's, a, it's a fine line. So when students do leave, um, there are some, some options that they have, for, uh, and this is for, for middle school. For those of you who are teaching middle school, they can get the traditional high school diploma, uh, which would be ideal, uh, where they uh, interact with, with students uh, in the classroom and, and have that um, interaction and receive a diploma. Uh, alternate high school diploma, if students just for, aren't, um, having those uh, positive classroom experiences, uh, but still uh, have met the standards, uh, they can, they can uh, apply for the alternate high school diploma. Uh, dual or concurrent enrollment programs, and that's taking classes um, in school and then also maybe taking some AP classes uh, so they can get some college credits. And then early, uh, there's a great program uh, in Miami-Dade County, uh, the School of Advanced Studies, 
uh, that does an excellent job of preparing students um, to, for college when they when they graduate. And then early college high school. So that is going to uh, high school and then also at the same time dual enrollment in possibly a community college and then graduating uh, both uh, with their AA and, and high school. So if you're preparing your student to go to work um, and that is their desire, then here are some things that you can um, do to, to help them. And, and to prepare, and that's uh, set up some internships, whether paid or unpaid, where our students with disabilities can get the, the hands-on experience in hopefully a field that they're interested in. Uh, it could be something as, whether it be in a, in a uh, it could be simple or, or complex, you know, depending on what the interest and the, and the student's ability is. Um, mentorships, providing a mentor um, so if a student is, is not in the formal work environment, uh, perhaps having a mentor that can help um, develop that rapport and, and, and guide students through the work process. Apprenticeships, if, if we know students are, are in a particular path and, and, and they want a specific skill, um, then developing that apprenticeships, which is a combination of internship and mentorship. Um, which can also be paid or unpaid, but mostly paid. Uh, paid employment, of course, that would be ideal, trying to get students um, into employment, whether it be at the supermarket or uh, fast food or, or whatever is, is, is in their skill set, or you know, uh, maybe a traditional office job or, or CEO, you know, who knows? Uh, and then career pathways, preparing students for the right careers and making sure that pathway is clear especially if it's tied into education. So if it's a pathway um, that requires perhaps a master's or a bachelor's or a PhD, then having those conversations uh, with those students um, about the need for to supplement their work desires with, with education and, and determining how, um, what that process is going to look like. So college students with disabilities are transitioning to college. Um, there was a survey done asking students, well, because students are very, um, have lots of structure because of the IDEA Act, um, they have a lot of structure and, 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 and time and, 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 and resources dedicated to them. And sometimes when that, when that handholding stops, which is natural for, for any student, uh, any college student, then it's a, it's, um, a, a, a tough transition. So some college students have reported uh, feeling overloaded with work, uh, prioritizing, knowing where to begin assignments. Um, they're getting hit with a writing uh, uh, um, that are sometimes um, more comprehensive than what they were used to in high school. Uh, the lack of regular assignments and feedback when you get a midterm and a final, uh, and that's what your grade relies on, that could be a shock for students. Um, that they have improper study skills um, compared to other students, their test taking and preparation. Um, they've had challenge with note taking, listening comprehension, especially if they're in larger uh, classrooms at the community college or a four year level, larger lectures and, and, and unable to understand the instructor. Uh, organization, just not feeling organized and then, and then also not feeling overwhelmed with reading. So although these are the challenges, the reason why I'm putting this slide is, and we've talked about this, some of this, uh, these, are, this, these are all issues with a good preparation for post-secondary, for life after high school um, that, that can be addressed uh, throughout the curriculum uh, formally and informally. So for those of you in leadership roles, um, here are some nine steps uh, that you can take if you wanted to uh, start, if you don't have an existing program, you wanted to fine tune your program, um, here are nine steps to uh, prepare students for, for college. Uh, number one, educate IEP team members and special education faculty. So having that, um, having these resources and having these programs um, ready and, and, and encouraging all involved and especially the IET, PT members and faculty, you know, what are the rules? What are the regulations? What are the services that are available to students? Uh, giving everyone these, 
this information is going to help um, create your program and, and make your program uh, viable. Also, maybe perhaps a field trip, uh, a field trip to a college with the students so they can visit a disability office uh, and see what that's like and how they're set up. Uh, even if the student does not go to that college, they can at least uh, know what to look for and that there, there are campuses that have those. Uh, reach out to families. We all know that parental involvement is, is extremely important. And uh, you know, having the families involved and letting them know what services are out there um, and how they can help their student apply for services at the particular college that they're going to, um, that would be ideal. And you can practice. Um, so when students make the transition from eighth grade to high school, that would be a good time to, to talk about transition and, and get the parents involved. Because then when they, when they transition from high school to college, they've already been through a transition process and everyone knows um, you know, how to support each other. Um, number three, encourage students' future independence. Uh, this would be, can be done by, um, when the student progresses through high school, um, you may want to reduce the number of accommodations the student has, uh, especially if you know that it's an accommodation they're not going to get in college. So that's one way you can encourage students' future independence and get them ready for the transition by possibly uh, reducing or eliminating some of the accommodations. Uh, teach students to use, number four, teach students to use assistive technology. Um, they, meet, they will need to function independently and some colleges may not have um, be providing them with the technology. So it's important that they can figure out how to do that or how to ask for it uh, while they're in high school. And if they learn how to use it effectively in high school, then when they get to college, uh, that's gonna help them. Number five, give students the documentation they need. Going to college, some colleges require um, three years, no, no older than three years of official documentation of what the accommodation is. And sometimes our students uh, after freshman year, they may not uh, be tested or provide any more supplemental documentation. So if you can help students out by having them go back and get um, documentation in their junior, senior year, so that way when they get to college, uh, they have the paperwork that they need um, to apply for uh, an accommodation. Number six, educate students about their disabilities and strengths. So, and this goes back to, you know, creating the low profile, creating a learning profile and, and helping students um, know what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. Uh, you may even go so far as have students um, lead an IEP meeting, which could be uncomfortable at first, but then this will also get them in the habit of talking about what their challenges are. So when they do that at the college level, uh, they're already uh, versed in that. Explicitly teach learning and organizational strategies. Uh, we just talked about that. Note taking, test preparation, time management, written expression, reading, tracking assignments. Uh, the more students, and this is this goes holds true for all students. The more students can better be better organized. It'll help them in school and in the workplace. Um, number eight: Ensure that students are prepared to apply for accommodations at college. Uh, this goes back to having that tour of the college and explaining uh, what type of students are out there, what type of transition services are out there at the colleges. You know, ideally students will meet with their case manager, the advisor, their counselor, or transition specialist uh, in their senior year to, to determine what possible accommodations they're gonna need for the college. And when they're applying for the college, if the college is gonna have that accommodation. And then for those of you in upper management, um, or superintendents, you know, make sure that this, this plan to help students with disabilities prepare for college is, is, and transition, uh, whether it be to the workforce or to college, uh, that there is a district-wide transition program where the entire, well, no matter what middle school, high school, grammar school you're in, in your district, you're getting similar education and similar support services and that everyone is in uh, communication. And it's not just being left up to the last year uh, or just one teacher, uh, but rather the, the whole entire process. So you want to implement a cohesive, comprehensive transition plan uh, that includes time, space, uh, personnel, and that's important, and then the appropriate training. So you want to make sure you support your faculty and staff 
with training to, to successfully execute these services. So here are some examples of how you can, in high school, uh, start preparing students for what they're going to be expecting in college. So in high school, one accommodation, you may provide study guides to your students. Well, instead, maybe you train students to create their own study guides, because that's going to be an expectation in college. Uh, spelling mistakes and writing assignments and tests ignored or not counted. Instead, teach students to use spell checkers uh, or the spell check function, grammar check function on the, on the word or the computer uh, to help them with their homework. Uh, teacher or aide explains test questions while they may happen in high school. You may want to uh, provide instruction and test taking strategies and in intentionally underline keywords, rephrase confusing questions as statements and teach them how to do that. Uh, modification of assignment le length um, that may, may or may not occur in college. So instead you can improve students' writing skills so that they meet the expectations. And this is something that you would gradually do, uh, not just right away. Um, extension of deadlines for papers, maybe help students develop their time management skills if that's the issue. Um, and breaking big assignments into small pieces, setting deadlines, uh, especially if the classes just have midterms and finals. Um, in your high school, you may have a teacher A prompt students to pay attention. Instead, you want to encourage your students and all students to sit near the front of the class uh, and to use technology tools that prompt for refocusing. So for technology tools for students, how you can help um, transition from high school to college. Uh, if students are having difficulty in reading, traditionally a teacher or a parent may read the text out loud or the reduced reading assignments. And perhaps maybe with the use of technology, uh, they can in invest in text-to-speech software. And there are some um, apps and, and, and companies that do that. Uh, for composing papers, uh, teacher or parent traditionally would serve as a scribe as a student dictates or organize their ideas. But once again, uh, more speech to text software that can do that. So this is teaching students to solve the problems on their own. Uh, note taking, instead of having a teacher or aide provide notes, having digital recording devices uh, for lectures, even on the iPhone app, there's a voice memo app that, that students can use to take notes if they're not paying attention or to re-listen to the lecture. Uh, and then exam preparation, again, study guides, but there are some applications um, where students can create flashcards um, and quizzes on their own with the material uh, to help them to learn. So giving students that independence, uh, and even if they don't apply these type of skills in the classroom, they can also apply these uh, to the workforce, uh, to, to any program that they tr transition to. So in general, um, as we prepare all of our students for adult life, whether you're a teacher, an administrator, a community partner, uh, we wanna make sure we set high expectations for our students, all of our students, and we need to believe that all of our students can learn and be successful. Uh, use a person-centered planning approach, so putting that person, uh, charging that student with, uh, and motivating them to take charge and, and, and be the one that, that that handles the problems and, and addresses it and finding the resources and basing everything on their interests and treating the students as individuals. Uh, support the students' social and emotional learning. We, all, we know students are on all different types of the spectrum and, and, and finding that right balance to support them socially and emotionally. And that, and that goes back to setting high expectations. Uh, provide the student with support to make their decisions. So even if it's not something you agree with, uh, but it will still get them on the right path, uh, providing that support to that student. Um, and then counseling the student and their representative to make informed decisions. So anyone that's in their life or uh, part of the IEP team, um, help them to make uh, informed decisions. So for school leadership, if you're, when you're implementing this school-wide um, transition program, um, the same thing as the individuals, uh, you want to establish high expectations uh, by yourself um, as the leaders, uh, talking about it in meetings and, sco and school-wide conferences and, and um, meetings, 
and um, in writing and with, with training, uh, provides students with disabilities access to rigorous coursework, ensures students with disabilities have IEP goals that are aligned with the academic content in which the student is enrolled and ensure that students with disabilities receive the specialized instruction, related services, and other support they need to meaningfully access, be involved, and make progress in the general education curriculum. Once again, this is a, this is sums up uh, the reason why we're here, and 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 why we do these webinars and do these workshops. Uh, you know, to make sure that we are giving our best to our students. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because uh, if you're listening to this, you have a passion and a desire. Uh, to better yourself and to better students. So please take this and take this information and, and share this uh, with those that may not be as ambitious. Uh, provide students with disabilities opportunity to access college and career ready standards and assessments. And then what most organizations, what most schools fail to do is to ensure that educators have the true and resources necessary to support success. So we provide lots of maybe technology, lots of resources, but we don't provide any professional development or any support on how teachers can use and implement um, these, these resources that we have. So if you have the authority, then make sure there is constant professional development for our teachers. Uh, and when you're thinking about person-centered planning, as I alluded to earlier, that's including the, the, the student in the planning process, uh, and anyone who has knowledge of the student's academic and social history, whether that be the, the specialist, the counselor, the dean, um, the, the parent, um, view the student as an individual rather than as a diagnosis or a disability. Uh, use everyday language and transition planning rather than professional jargon. I know we wanna teach students uh, vocabulary and um, get them ready, but just sometimes it's just as important just to tell them in a language that, that they understand. And then ensure that when you're, when you're, when you're practicing this person-centered planning, that the goals are developed based on the student's strengths, interests, and capacities. And the only way to do that is to know the student and to have that conversation with student at least at the age of 16, but if not earlier um, in, in a more formal capacity. So teachers can address students' social needs. Um, if, if, if you're preparing students for the workplace and for college uh, by doing role playing, uh, by doing intentional social immersion learning programs, uh, having a positive school climate. And that is also um, part of a webinar we talked about, our differentiated learning, creating an inclusive classroom. So there's more information about that in those webinars if you want to take a look at those. Uh, set up a simulated work environment in the classroom for teachers. That's an excellent um, strategy. Um, and you can incorporate the phone and the time clock. Uh, having field trips to jobs uh, and then having students fill out job applications and creating resumes. Uh, they could be for fake jobs or jobs that they see in the newspaper, uh, but having them go through that process uh, will help them. Teachers, what you could also do, uh, before we talked about leaders, now we're talking about uh, the teachers, uh, support students in their transition goals, including post-secondary education, career and independent living goals. Uh, you know, college is not for everyone. While we are promoting that, um, it just may be a capacity or just a desire. Uh, so just getting students ready for, for anything uh, so they can hopefully fully support themselves when they, when they graduate. Uh, ensure that students are actively involved in their IEP meetings, understand their IEPs um, for instruction assessments and any supplementary aids and services to facilitate their education in the least restrictive environment. Help students develop skills to direct their own learning and that was, uh, we, I provided some of those samples earlier. Use the person-centered planning and then create and maintain a system that supports family involvement and empower family to support the self-determination of their sons and daughters. So parental involvement is, is a key component and essential. And we're gonna give you more tips next. So in order to encourage parental support, uh, you wanna encourage, encourage the parents to, to, to provide input and not look at it as negative, but it's something as, as what's gonna help the student in the long run and get their, get their um, feedback on the interests, aptitudes, strengths, weaknesses, and the goals. Uh, encourage them to actively participate in the IEP meetings and, and have them realize the importance. And you wanna share um, some of the strengths uh, for them and some uh, progress that students are, ma are making 
uh, to give them that positive encouragement. Um, you want to help them create goals uh, for the child and create goals for them to help with the child. Uh, any presentations and workshops you can do uh, for the parents, uh, and they may not be traditional person to person, but they may be online or remote uh, for those parents that, that, that have to work two jobs or, or just can't make it. And then any resources that you have, uh, your district, uh, the multidisciplinary center has a ton of resources uh, that are available to, to help students to be successful and to help the parent help the student with the transition process and going to post-secondary programs and options. So please uh, utilize the services that are available to you teachers. So if all is said and done and all is done right, um, I want to show you what it would look like for, for a successful transition and then some of the challenges. So this is just one student's perspective on that. And then we will we'll end with this video. When you guys were in high school, what did you want to do after graduation? I thought I would always like to go to college. I wanted to go to college too. And I had to do college too. What do you think is the best thing about college? I get to learn about new people and just really get to make new friends. Yeah, we learn, we learn to the class, but we learn by ourselves. Until five years ago, these students did not have college opportunities, but now they do. Hi, my name is Haley and I've been in college for one semester. I see myself as a hard working college student and I also like to have fun. I would definitely advise high school students to go to college because college will open up your mind in a variety of different ways. And going through college will open up better career opportunities for you. William Thomas McMillan, Will McMillan for short. High school was the, it was fun, but now being in college is more exciting because I get more of a freedom. I wanted to have a college experience like my older brother because I, when I went to parents weekend with my parents at, um, at my brother's college, I saw, you know, that he was in a frat and, you know, all his friends and all that stuff and how he enjoyed it. And I, plus I wanted to go to Vanderbilt. <laughs> in our self-awareness class, we learned about, you know, how to write a bill, how to, you know, budget your money. We get to learn how to control our body and our health. Yes. Real tech, we get to learn about going on the internet and finding facts. The one class I did take, introduction to stars and galaxies. I learned about the different effects of stars, and uh, I like that um, you learn a lot of things that you previously did not think before. Oh, it's cute. That's light up, and it does light electricity. Move through it, and what do we call it? It's a demo. Awesome, a conductor, right. So copper is a conductor. Uh, my mentors, also known as our bachelors, for fun, they can help us with our homework, they have lunch with us. My mentor helps me with daily planning, tutoring, exercising, and they're my friend too. So this year I got to make a CD with one of my mentors and that was a lot of fun. Through my workout mentors, I've learned a variety of different workouts. I even learned how to do yoga. 
Although I probably won't be pursuing that, so. Uh, it's not fun. Nope. I think that's one of the best things about internships is that they help you glow on the inside. You feel more alive when you do things for people that really need your help. In the athletics or in many things. Well, my internship is Susan Gray. It's a school for kids. Um, what I do there, I laminate, I do laundry, I do the dishes, um, I get the mail, I clean the break room and the rainbow room and the conference room. I learned shelving books at the Divinity Library. I love the people that I worked with. I thought that, uh, that my main job that I wanted to accomplish was become a radio broadcaster. But through this experience, in college, I've realized that there's a lot more jobs out there that I would actually like. Like, I wouldn't mind being a bookshelver. Okay. Hey, how are you? Whatever internship you have, they really need help, and we're there to help no matter what. Our students are having the confidence to make their own decisions and to problem solve on their own and to make decisions, make mistakes, and to learn that it's okay. I think I was a little nervous about like starting college because it was new and I, you know, was a little shy and I really didn't know how to ask for help, but now like I feel uh, confident and I feel like I belong. Like the first time I came here, I didn't know where to go. There was, there was a very big campus and there was a lot of people around and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know where to go for my end of my class. And it, was, it was really scary. Now I know where to go. Now I'm like comfortable where I'm going. <laughs> Did we explain about the teachers and professors here? So they want you to grow and succeed in life, and uh, I think that's what really helped me. The most exciting part of post-secondary education is increasing the quality of life that our students are going to have. They see their place in the world, they're excited about the world, they're asking for more and they're expecting it to happen. I think after I get through uh, through college, I'll be able to uh, put on my resume that uh, hey, I've done this, and so I I'd like to I'd like to have a chance to uh, get this job. Today is your day, and you gotta be responsible enough to know who you are and to be in college because back then your parents they got to know what they wanted to do and now we're going to live the same dream that's it So thank you. Hopefully you enjoyed that video. And I think it sums up a lot of the concepts and the, the ideas that we talked about. Uh, if, if we prepare our students and, and we, we give them that support uh, so that when they get to the college level, if that's what is in their future, uh, then that's what the goal is going to be. And that's what's going to have them be successful and have us uh, successfully prepare them for post-secondary opportunities. So that's all I have. Um, I know we're already at the end. So I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, and of course, if you're watching this uh, on demand, then uh, you could just email me um, at mrosa at kaiseruniversity.edu and I will be able to assist you in any way I can. And of course, uh, the wonderful and phenomenal multidisciplinary center is here uh, to assist you as well. So thank you very much. And it was a pleasure uh, uh, delivering this workshop for you this, 
today.